This is New Mexico Frontiers. Presented by Ferris Research. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of New Mexico Frontiers, the digital series. I'm Chad Brummett, and today we're going to unpack uh, the newest uh, branch of military uh, here in the United States, established in 2019 under the first Trump administration, and that is the U.S. Space Force. But it doesn't stop there. There's a lot to unpack, and obviously, as we know in this show, the story of digital uh, advancement, space advancement, the space economy... It is growing day by day. Gabe Mounts, who is with uh, the, uh, I don't want to get the, the office wrong. So Gabe, I'm going to, I'm going to have you tell me what <laughs> okay. office you were with, because again, it's, it's vast. Yeah. There was a lot. Yeah. Let me see if I can unpack it for you. I actually, <laughs> uh, I work for the Air Force Research Lab. Mm-hmm. It's an entity that is the science and tech arm of the Department of the Air Force. And those of us that are in the Department of the Air Force now, um, we have to say it that way because the Space Force is the newest military service. Uh, December 20th, 2019 is when it was born, Mm -hmm. carved out of the Air Force. And so, you know, you have these two new services or two services that are belonging to the Department of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because a lot of us uh, that are in the Space Force now come from the Air Force. Okay. Uh, This Air Force Research Lab is one lab, two services, meaning it's the service lab for the Department of the Air Force that's always kind of served the Air Force as its science and tech arm. Mm-hmm. But when, of course, the uh, Space Force stood up, now it serves the Space Force. Mm-hmm. Um, and that component, the Space Force component of the Air Force Research Lab is here um, at Kirtland Air Force Base here in New Mexico near Albuquerque. Um, and those of us that work for that part of the Air Force Research Lab, we were all Air Force, um, you could call us airmen, if you will. Okay. They call the both the civilians and the military that serve, uh, the civil servants and the military that serve in that service, um, airmen. If you're okay. on the Air Force side. But when Space Force was born, they moved us all mm-hmm. into the Space Force, and now we're all called Guardians. Guardians, okay. Yep. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Now, doing a little bit of digging on Space Force, I know that the, the early ideas go back all the way to the Reagan administration. Yes. So uh, this was something that has kind of been percolating for a number of years in the United States. Uh, as you were saying, December 2019, it was established... What does the Space Force do? What is yeah. what is the what are some of the primary missions of this this agency? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a question that we get quite a lot. Um, if, if you go back, most of the the space component of what the military does, um, we have a lot of things in space. We've had up up there for a while that do different functions for the U.S. military. Mm-hmm. A good portion of that was um, operated controlled by the U.S. Air Force. Probably the most well-known is the GPS system, right? Okay. The GPS system that we all use to navigate. If you've, uh, I used it this morning to get here <laughs> to the, the studio, yeah, right? Exactly. We all have it on our phone. Uh, that was really under uh, the U.S. Air Force until the Space Force stood up. Okay. So now, um, navigation, what we call precision navigation and timing, the GPS system, is uh, controlled and operated by the U.S. Space Force as is all the satellite communications that the whole force uses to do their operations across the world, uh, as well as a lot of what we call um, remote uh, sensing. It's really just a lot of cameras in space looking down on Earth uh, for us to do all the intelligence things that we need to 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 prep our operations and do our operations. That's all more or less controlled by the U.S. Space Force. Okay. Now, the reason it's important is because for national security reasons, over the years, um, we've learned and, and we've seen there's, there's an economic element to this. Mm-hmm. Um, in the last many years, uh, we're seeing uh, launch costs to get things into orbit go way down. And that's due to uh, some of the billionaires, right, like, mm-hmm. like Elon Musk, uh, like Jeff Bezos, like many others. Um, they've driven launch costs down, which means access to space is much cheaper than it used to be which means a lot more of the nation states across the world can have access to space. It used to be a nation state thing to get into into space because it was so expensive. Very few nations could do that. Now it's a lot easier. And so we're seeing um, both nation states and private individuals put a lot of things into orbit and it's getting a lot of, it's getting really congested in orbit. So we care about that, right, as the Space Force because we don't want our systems 
um, negatively impacted by all that congestion. Mm -hmm. But we're also now seeing those countries that might be our adversaries also using space differently and, and really um, pushing the boundaries against us about how we use space. Um, and so we, the Space Force was set up to make sure we're focused on space as a domain so that we can protect that domain to continue all the other operations that we do across the world. Gotcha. Yeah, huge task that you've got huge there. Task. Now, you've touched on something that's going to kind of dovetail us into uh, one of the components I wanted to talk about, Elon Musk and SpaceX. Yeah. This is a private entity that is, is working with government contracts. You know, we, we, uh, we've seen the rockets that have taken uh, payload up to the ISS, and, it, you know, obviously is going to pay potentially play a huge role down the road. Right. Um, one of the things that you do, one of the many hats that you wear, is in the tech engagement office uh, with AFRL. Um, and this is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this office, you're really looking how to grow the space economy here in New Mexico yes. with, with spin-outs, but as well as spin-ins. Right. Um, spin-outs, so let's unpack, first of all, what we mean by spin-outs and spin-ins and how, how you're sort of orchestrating these. Yeah, so the Air Force Research Lab, like the national labs, right, like Sandia, Los Alamos, and all the others across the country, they're, they're always chartered to take all of that great scientific research and get it into the commercial uh, sphere because mm -hmm. that's where, um, you know, in our current kind of capitalist society, that's how you actually gain traction with that technology is right. commercializing it. Right. Um, so that's called spin out. That's tip the, what I would call the traditional way of tech transfer. We're taking our stuff in the lab, getting it outside. Um, but increasingly, uh, our lab in particular, because of this growing space economy, um, we're also looking at how do we assess that technology that's growing in the commercial realm, sort of separate from what the government has funded, and determining is there a mission fit mm -hmm. for this uh, technology. And, and if there is, then how can we pipeline it into um, our technology, our, our capability, so that we can use it for space force purposes and largely for what I would call national security space purposes. Mm -hmm. And so my office is sort of on the forefront of doing that, what I would call tech scouting towards spinning in. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing it right here in Albuquerque, right here in New Mexico. So kind of the ancillary benefit is it's giving us an opportunity to attract companies um, and, the, and the capital stack, the venture capital and other financing things behind it to New Mexico um, and and helping to kind of grow that economic sector around the aerospace market. Gotcha. What what is the the I guess the temperature right now or the the population of these entrepreneurs that we're looking to spin in now? As I said, we've we've spoken to a number of businesses that have been enterprised by former LANL scientists, Sandia National Labs members from the Bioscience Center of the University of New Mexico. But I, I'm, I'm curious about that idea of kind of working in the opposite direction, that you see some entrepreneur uh, or enterprise out there that was not cultivated in, in these departments. Right. Are there a lot of them? Is, I mean, what, is, what does that environment look like right now here in New Mexico? Yeah, I would say there is, um, it, it's relatively robust. I think it's still a bit nascent compared okay. to the national uh, if you just look at the national context of what entrepreneurs are doing, it, maybe it's a little bit less than that national, but it's a lot more robust than people think. Okay. Now, what our office is doing is looking at that across the country, right? Okay. It's a national perspective. Um, but as we've done that, we've seen there is a lot of great uh, work being done here in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And what's neat is you have a lot of the entities like the two national labs, you have the universities here, they're all looking to kind of spin and commercialize that technology. And we're sort of on the opposite end of that spectrum then looking to bring that technology and capability now back into uh, federal service. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've seen uh, several companies uh, that have come out of the, one of those other institutions. Um, and I'll take an example of mm -hmm. uh, RS21. Yeah. Uh, I talk about them a lot because they're a great example. They, uh, you could think of them as uh, sort of a spin out of Sandia National Labs. Okay. Um, and they were looking at uh, basically uh, big data analytics, mainly for bio and health. Mm -hmm. um, and one year we ran a program, we have a program in my portfolio called the Hyperspace Challenge. Mm -hmm. It's actually run by CNM Ingenuity. Um, and that's really kind of an accelerator to help us look and assess these technology, these capabilities like I've been describing. And through one of our cohorts, um, RS21 came into the cohort. And one of the problem sets we had that year was, hey, how do you predict 
the, the health of a satellite when it's on orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, once a satellite goes down on orbit, you're kind of done with it, right? Yeah. There's no way to quickly access it and repair it. And so predicting how that satellite's going to behave in the future is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So RS-21 came to us with this oncology algorithm, an algorithm to predict the onset of cancer in cancer patients, mm -hmm. um, and applied it to the satellite health problem set. And it turned out their algorithm, their algorithm worked perfectly wow. to help us predict the future of how a satellite might go down. And so now they have created this whole separate line of business in aerospace that they had not originally thought of. And so it's just a perfect example of how there's this now growing ecosystem with all the right components, including what we're doing to help, you know, underwrite uh, companies and pull them into the government sphere. Yeah. The other ancillary benefit is that as we and the government fund these companies, we have a, a special tranche of money that the Space Force and Air Force put out that allows these small companies to get non-dilutive funding. But what we're seeing is as they get non-dilutive funding and they get um, the government as a bona fide customer, um, it's sort of vetting that company as a bona fide company, and they there they use they then use that thereby to go get some venture capital funds or other financing to help build that business. Wow! And so to us, it's like a virtuous circle here. Locally. Yeah, it really seems ecosystem. like it. Yep. Yeah, because it continues to develop. Now, w when you found this uh, RS twenty one. Did, did they come to you with this algorithm? Did yeah. you see the potential of, because I, I was reading about that, I'm just blown away, uh, I, I guess the sort of the creative thinking that yeah. came from, it, this algorithm is working to detect the health within human beings, let's use it to detect the health of space objects. Most people are not gonna put those two together. Exactly. <laughs> was, was, that, was that you putting it together or was it RS-21 saying, we think we got something here? Well, it's indicative of the way we run these programs, okay. right? My portfolio has several of these accelerators and incubators, several of them here locally. So I mentioned the Hyperspace Challenge. We also do a lot of this work at our Q station in Knob Hill mm -hmm. and we have uh, a cohort there that's an incubator. We call it the Space Tech Cohort. Uh, and then New Space Nexus runs a cohort for us called the Igniter at mm -hmm. their place, their launch pad. And all of this is based around our problem sets. So we first bring our problem sets to bear. We then um, publicize what those problems are or the fact that we might be running a cohort and then invite companies in. Gotcha. And it's up to the companies to determine, do, do I have technology that might be applicable to what this problem set is? Mm -hmm. And then it's that incubation acceleration piece that then lets us determine, is there a there there? Is there a match mm -hmm. to what they're developing and what we need to take them into that next stage? So it's that kind of acceleration component that's really the genius. Yeah. And the reason we're doing that is we do want to look at technology orthogonal. I call it orthogonal, meaning... I don't want to look at your traditional aerospace companies or technology. I do want to look at that, but I want to look more broadly in that because you never know what you're going to find. You right. might find somebody in bio and health that, um, you know, that could be useful to what we need to do in, in the federal government. Right. And it seems to, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Gabe, that um, this, this really sort of feels like this is what the future of our space development, space economy, the Artemis mission, getting ourselves to Mars, it's going to require that collaboration between the federal government, private institutions, and mixing these minds and resources together to get us to these next steps. Am I, am I wrong in thinking that? No, I definitely think you're right about that. In fact, I think that's why you see a lot of, in the national context, even international context, you're seeing a lot of venture capital people put down a lot of money into this growing yeah. new space economy because they think the exact same thing. There's a lot of really smart, innovative entrepreneurs that are getting into the business because it's so cheap to put things in orbit now. And we're seeing things that we just have never seen before. And mm -hmm. so for us as the federal government, especially as the Air Force, this is an important way for us to look across that landscape and figure out how can we partner to both achieve national security objectives while also achieving economic development objectives. Yeah. Both both important to our national security. Yeah, absolutely. As, as, as one grows, I imagine the other one is going to grow as well. And if they can stay in concert, that can only mean success down the road. Yes. Um, if people want more information on this, because there is, there is so much to unpack with what AFRL is doing, what the Tech Engagement Office and the U.S. Space Force is doing, where do you recommend us go online to kind of keep up to date with all of these developments and advancements. Yeah, so the Air Force Research Lab itself has just their normal website. Um, I, I don't know if it's exactly afrl.mil mm -hmm. or .gov, but if you just look for the Air Force Research Lab, you'll easily come across what that okay. is. 
Um, and you can drill down to find the component here in New Mexico and what we're doing. Okay. And then each of those individual uh, programs, if you just go online and look for the Hyperspace Challenge, Q Station, New Space Igniter, um, you'll easily find those programs as well, which will kind of also give you pathways into um, all of this uh, kind of innovative things that, that I described. Yeah, yeah, lots going on with it. Um, one question that I do have for you, and this is just something that I'm, you know, curious in what we have been exploring and unpacking here on New Mexico Frontiers, both the digital show and the on uh, the on air show, is the idea of Space Valley and New Mexico yeah. really playing a huge role, if not becoming the capital of Space Valley. Do you think that's a realistic thing that we could do? I definitely think I'm one of the biggest proponents for this. Space Valley was born out of uh, a lot of that commonality between the entities in the state that were already doing this work, right? We've had a long history in space in New Mexico, right? All the way back to Robert Goddard Mm -hmm. uh, down in Roswell. Um, A ton of stuff has happened over the years that that we have the right... um, brew, if you will, the right mixture of of things happening here. Mm -hmm. And Space Valley is really just the culmination of all of us working together to say, look at space is a new domain of commerce. Let's take advantage of that. Let's advocate for this as a sector. Um, There's a lot of people doing the high tech stuff, but space is for everybody, right? As this sector grows, there's all kinds of other ways to get into this Mm -hmm. growing economy. And I think we have a huge, huge opportunity here that that we are sort of exploiting, if you will, um, and we just need to keep leaning into. And I think uh, we're we're right there, right? We're already seeing benefits. We're right there. Yeah. And you, you hit on something, too, that I think is really important as well um, that we want to hammer home to folks potentially maybe looking for a new job or looking, you know, a different career path or, you know, uh, opening it up to that it's for everyone, that you don't necessarily have to be an astronaut, a nuclear physicist, a, you know, mechanic engineer uh you do you need artists you need journalists you need writers you need advocates there there are multiple roles to play uh in this story and uh, it sounds like new ones are being written almost by the day yeah i think um if you look at the individual entrepreneurial uh venture back startup model for instance right a lot of those um small companies even though they're maybe driven by the tech um people that are really innovative in the tech side of the house They need people who are really great communicators. Mm -hmm. They need people who are, uh, I really think, great in the entertainment and arts because Mm -hmm. they, especially for space, right? How do you you visualize a satellite and Mm -hmm. what it's doing in orbit, right? It's very hard to do that without the right um, underpinning of communicators that can kind of make that happen. Yeah. So as you see the population of these companies grow, they're going to need all kinds of people like that, business people, executives. Um, that is all going to be, it, it is growing right now across the country, and I think it's growing here. Mm-hmm. And so I think people who are in those domains need to not discount the fact that they could have a career in space and not have to be a rocket scientist to do right. it. Yeah, good to get in on the ground floor because this thing is just only going upwards. You know, no pun intended on that, talking no, about yeah. space. There. Exactly. <laughs> Gabe, really appreciate your time, your expertise this morning. Thank you for coming in and unpacking all of this. I'm sure down the road we will, our paths will cross again because as we said, Uh, Space Valley is just going to grow and the work that we are doing here in New Mexico is going to grow. So again, thank you for all you're doing. Thanks for your time today. Thanks for having me, Chip. Absolutely. And if you want a full recap of this, if you want other episodes of New Mexico Frontiers, both the digital version and the on-air version, head over to krqe.com. You can also download the Kirky Now app on your smart TVs and streaming devices. Until next time, I'm Chad Brummett for New Mexico Frontiers, the digital series.